It began here at the Kennedy Space Center, Florida, last summer. A pair of spacecraft, Viking 1 and Viking 2, were readied for their separate journeys to Mars. Each is really two spacecraft in one. A 5,000-pound orbiter with cameras and communications gear, and sealed inside two saucer-like capsules at the other end, the Viking landing craft. A camera-equipped automated biological and chemistry laboratory and seismic station, which has been purged of earthly organisms by being heated in a huge oven. The 11-month, 420-million-mile trip for the two Viking orbiter landers was set in motion by two launches. One in August, one in September. Earth shrinks smaller and smaller as the two Vikings head toward their Martian rendezvous. Then, braking rockets fire on command, slowing the first Viking explorer enough that it goes into orbit around Mars. For the next two weeks, the orbiting spacecraft will survey the surface below, transmitting pictures of possible landing sites to scientists on Earth. The Martian surface should be a study in contrasts. From vast, dust-swept plains to immense canyons and frost-covered plateaus, huge gullies and channels photographed by earlier Mariner spacecraft are believed to have been caused by running water sometime in the distant past. If all goes as planned, the first Viking lander will separate from the orbiting command ship and descend to the Martian surface, landing at 9.40 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, July 4th. The second Viking is scheduled to land on September 4th, 1,000 miles to the northeast of Viking 1. How will Viking go about looking for life on Mars? We asked Dr. Richard Young, NASA's chief of planetary biology. We look for life on Mars in much the same way we would look for life on Earth if we were forced to use an automated device. You know, we don't send a scientist along. If we were sending a little wagon out into the Sahara Desert or the, one of the dry valleys of the Antarctic, uh, which had to function all by itself with automated equipment, this is probably exactly what we would send. And let me say, by the way, that we're looking primarily for microorganisms. Uh, it would be rather fruitless of us to look for horses on Mars. Uh, we wouldn't look for horses on Earth if we were looking for life because the chances would be uh, a million to one against finding them uh, with a random search. Viking's mechanical arm pulls in a scoopful of Martian soil and drops it into a one cubic foot box that's really three completely automated testing laboratories. It is here that the possibilities for or against the presence of life will be determined. What will it mean to Earthlings if life is found on Mars? It must mean that the universe is, is literally uh, an, an inhabited universe with many planets that have life on it. Now, if there are many planets that have life on it, there is no doubt at all that terrestrial life is not going to be the most uh, advanced civilization, the most uh, highest level of consciousness. We must be somewhere in the broad spectrum of possibility. And that drives you to the conclusion that uh, there may be conscious life elsewhere in the universe. Vikings to Mars and the search for life there. This country's first close-up scientific exploration of the Red Planet. And when, in 1956, Venus was for the first time observed by a radio telescope, the planet was discovered to be emitting radio waves as if it were at an extremely high temperature. But the real demonstration that the surface of Venus was astonishingly hot came when the first spacecraft penetrated the obscuring clouds of Venus and slowly settled on the surface of the nearest planet. These were the unmanned spacecraft of the Soviet Venera series. There's some nitrogen, a little water vapor, and other gases, but only the merest trace of hydrocarbon. And the clouds turn out to be not water, but a concentrated solution of sulfuric acid. Even in the high clouds, Venus is a thoroughly nasty place. The 
clouds are stained yellow by sulfur. There are great lightning storms. As we descend, there are increasing amounts of the noxious gas, sulfur dioxide. The pressures become so high that early Venera spacecraft were crushed like old tin cans by the weight of the surrounding atmosphere. Beneath the clouds, in the dense, clear air, it's about as bright as on an overcast day on Earth. But the atmosphere is so thick that the ground seems to ripple and distort. The atmospheric pressure down here is 90 times that on Earth. The temperature is 380 degrees centigrade, 900 Fahrenheit, hotter than the hottest household oven. This is a world marked by searing heat, crushing pressures, sulfurous gases, and a desolate, reddish landscape, far from the balmy paradise imagined by some early scientists. Venus is the one place in the solar system most like hell. But today, as in ancient tradition, there are travelers who will dare a visit to the underworld. Venera 9 was the first spacecraft in human history to return a photograph from the surface of Venus. It found the rocks curiously eroded, perhaps by the corrosive gases, perhaps because the temperature is so high that the rocks are partly molten and sluggishly flow. The Soviet Venera spacecraft, their electronics long ago fried, are slowly corroding on the surface of Venus. They are the first spaceships from Earth ever to land on another planet. The reason Venus is like hell seems to be what's called the greenhouse effect. Ordinary visible sunlight penetrates the clouds and heats the surface, but the dense atmosphere blankets the surface and prevents it from cooling off to space. An atmosphere 90 times as dense as ours, made of carbon dioxide, water vapor, and other gases, lets in visible light from the sun, but will not let out the infrared light radiated by the surface. So the temperature rises until the infrared radiation trickling out to space just balances the sunlight reaching the surface. The greenhouse effect can make an Earth-like world into a planetary inferno. In this cauldron, there is not likely to be anything alive, even creatures very different from us. Organic and other conceivable biological molecules would simply fall to pieces. He said, I have, I have been out of the hedge. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. To all the people in my country and the world, my greetings. My greetings. My greetings. My country, please have faith in me, and I will, my team will.